Good morning and welcome. A few quick reminders before we get started with the program. Everything that you type into the, the chat box is visible to all the moderators, so there is, there is no such thing as privacy on uh, Collaborate. So, so beware what you type. Please leave your microphone turned off unless you're actually speaking to the group, and that way we won't get any um, echoes and um, background noise. And he, these are the links for agents to register to get continuing education credit for being here with us this morning and also to log in your attendance from folks in your county. I'm Lucy Bradley. I'm the Extension Specialist for Urban Horticulture and the State Master Gardener uh, Coordinator. And I will be your MC this morning. Welcome. Normally at this time I would be introducing you to Lee Jay Temple and thanking her for her assistance in, in managing all the technology for us. But Lee Jay is home with Emma Grace, who was just born last week. These are pictures of Lee Jay's uh, daughter. So she will uh, be out on, on maternity leave and uh, beautiful little girl. <coughs> so you're stuck with me. If you've got um, technology questions, put them in the chat box and we'll all work together to, to, to help. Okay. Um, and that also means if you can help me with managing the chat box and, and watching if there's questions or content that slips through that little window before I see it, um, feel free to get my attention by raising your hand or, or um, using your mic to, to point it out. So just a quick review of, of uh, Collaborate. The, let me just grab my pointer. The talk button is um, right over here just above the participant list. You can push that down when you want to talk, and please turn it off when you're not talking. There are, uh, let's see. There are a number of different <laughs> options that you have. Oh, somebody got their mic on. Okay, thanks. Have for participating in the program. There's a emoticon where you can use a smiley face or whatever to indicate your, you know, your interest in, in what's happening. There's an ability for you to tell us that you're, you've stepped away from your computer, so we won't be waiting for you to respond. You can raise your hand um, if, if you want to speak or, or to, to con contribute. And then we also have a poll, polling section where you, know, you can answer yes or no or pick A, B, C, D, depending on what the question is. There's also a chat box down at the, at the bottom where you can type questions or input um, information that you want to share. Do you have any questions about Collaborate and, and, and how you can participate this morning? Okay, let's start by um, finding out where, where everybody's from. If you would grab your pointer over on, on the side and then just uh, put it in front of, of your county and, and click, then we'll get a sense of what parts of the state are represented this morning. I see somebody from Wake County. Let's see the, have the rest of you guys weigh in. There you go. We have 45 people on the, the talk this morning, so we'll give you a minute to get your buttons pushed. Let's see. Okay, has everybody gone over to the side, um, clicked on the second from the top button? That it, on mine it looks like a pointer. Yours might look like a sun. There's a lot of different things, and then you can just click over on, on the side. Okay, thanks. Wanted to be sure you knew that we have a website for plants, pests, and pathogens, and it has lots of great information on it. There's a schedule with the handouts, tells you who the speakers are going to be, what's happening. There's lots of um, information about where you can go if you don't want to download it yourself at home, where are the different sites that you can go to be with a group to do it. The recordings are linked. There's lots of technology tips about how to work with Collaborate and strategies. There is um, information about the plant clinic and the different departments that, that sponsor the program. 
So there's lots of information here, including um, the schedule and the handouts. So, so if you go over, let me grab my little finger. If you go over here, you, you can click on the year, and it gives you a, a link to the overview of the programs as well as um, you know links to the recordings of the sessions. Okay. This one second. We've got a great program set up for this morning. We're going to start off with, with Stephen Frank from the entomology department. We'll have an advertisement from the Showstoppers group about the um, plants that they're promoting. Then our featured speaker will be on food safety, uh, both in school gardens and community gardens. And we'll have Mike Munster with current diseases. So full lineup. <coughs> Stephen Frank is our first speaker. He's an assistant professor here at NC State in the Department of Entomology. He got his master's and his PhD from the University of Maryland. And his focus here at NC State is on pest management of ornamental plants and insect ecology. The ultimate goal of his research is to reduce the insecticide use and its associated risks in ornamental nurseries, greenhouses, and landscapes. And he's doing this in two different ways. One of those is looking at production practices that reduce the pest outbreak, so lead to, to the need for less pesticides. So encouraging natural enemies in a habitat to protect and how to protect those natural enemies from pesticides, and also improving scouting techniques to, to predict pest outbreaks. And the second way that he's doing that is understanding the ecology of the interaction between plants, herbivores, and natural en enemies for insect pests. And by understanding that better, it improves our ability to benefit from those biological control options. Ultimately, his goal is, to, is a better understanding of the natural world that allow us to protect the environment and benefit from the valuable ecosystem services while supporting the, the economically important activities, such as production and maintenance of ornamental plants. Steve, we're thrilled that you're here today. Uh, welcome. And we're not hearing you, so I want to make sure that, that you know that you have to turn your microphone on. If you go to the top of the participant list, um, there's a button that says talk, and there's a microphone next to it. So you have to push that down in order for us to hear you. And I see that, that um, Steve has just popped over to the audio setup wizard to work out any issues that he might be having with um, his audio. So let's give him just a minute to do that. That only takes a, a couple of seconds. And I'll tell you that he is going to be focusing his talk on spring and fall canker worms. No sound in Lenore. I'm wondering if one of you other guys with, with admin privileges or, or anybody else in the room can pop off to help um, Lenore County figure out why they're not getting sound. <coughs> Steve's got his microphone going up. Oh, no, he's, he's back. Steve, are you back with us? He's typing in the chat box. So let's give him a second to do that. We can pop over to announcements if we need to give him a second to this. Uh, can you tell me the button for the mic? The button for the microphone is um, on the left-hand side. If you see the participant list, above that there's a, a button that says talk. And that's what you click for to turn the, the microphone on. That makes perfect sense. Can you hear Yay, me? Yay, welcome. All right, that was easier. I should have looked at that. OK, I used Illuminate before. I haven't used the new Blackboard yet, but now I have. Um, OK, well, thanks for, for having me, Lucy. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for attending. And I just wanted to give you a brief update on one of the things we're working on right now, and one of the pests that will be uh, coming out, well, it's actually out now, and um, one of the first things people will be noticing in spring, and that's canker worms. And um, if you remember in April of 2012, perhaps you noticed a lot of these green and brown caterpillars dangling from trees 
and getting stuck on people's sweaters and, and whatnot. Um, I know on campus there was whole sidewalks that were blocked with, with silk. And while that was fun for me to watch, a lot of people didn't like it. And, um, um, and that was all due to the canker worm outbreak that, that we had way more than usual in 2012 than we have since I've been here. And it sounds like um, other people you know, said that it, it was more than what we've had in a while. So there's really two uh, species of canker worms, spring canker worm and fall canker worm. Their biology is, is very similar except for one key difference. Um, they look very similar and they're managed very similar. So we won't get into the nuances of, of uh, how to distinguish the two except that, um, well here's a picture of the silk. Maybe you can see it, uh, you know, in, in the upper uh, left of the picture and strung on, on the bushes there. Um, so the eggs of both species of canker worm hatch in early spring. And so this is, is mid to late March or April. The caterpillars only feed for four to six weeks. And then they drop down and pupate below the trees in mulch or grass. We're trying to, we're trying to figure out exactly what the best habitat for them is. Um, but we have, uh, we know that they pupate in, in leaf litter and also in grassy areas. Um, and then the adults are wingless and they come out in the fall and in the spring. And this is the major difference between the two canker worm species. The fall canker worms, as you would expect, come out in the fall. This year they started coming out the first week of December, so really winter time. Um, they came out after that first hard freeze that we had in um, the end of November or December. And all of a sudden, we had been waiting and waiting, and then gobs of these things started coming out. And, um, and you can see in the picture, the adults don't have wings. And um, when you think about it, you don't really need wings if you're going to pupate under the same tree you were born in and then lay eggs in that tree. You can really just climb back up the tree. There's no real need to fly. So. Um, the spring canker worms have the same, same biology except they climb up the trees in, in spring. We're still waiting for them. We've found one or two of the, you know, who seem to have come out early, but we haven't seen the big, the big mass of, of adults that we saw of the fall canker worms. So for management of these guys, what has, has been done in the past and what we're working on is using these sticky, sticky tree bands. And all, of, all that these are is um, tape. This is a paper, paper sort of tape sold by the Tanglefoot Company. Other people use duct tape or they um, use burlap or they, they use um, you know, weed cloth or really anything that you can can um, string around a tree and then it's covered with this sticky tangle foot material which you can buy, you know, in your local garden center or you can buy it online at Amazon or, or other places. And it's, it's, it's super sticky goo and so you just smear it on the, the tape that we've put on and then when the, when the moths climb up the tree, they get stuck in the tape and, um, and then they can't lay eggs. And so if they don't get up to the top to lay eggs, then of course there's no eggs, which means no caterpillars, which means no defoliation of the trees. And so this is a pretty simple trick um, to take advantage of you know, a weakness in the biology of these critters. And, um, and reduce defoliation in, in trees. At the peak of the canker worm, the fall canker worm emergence, we were checking these strips 
every three days and we would get 700 or more per tree every three days. So there's really a lot of these things. Um, here's one up close. You can see, um, you know, it's easy to pull nice, beautiful pictures off of insectimages.org, um, but when you go out and look, you're going to see something closer to this, you know, that I took with my phone. So um, you can see the adult stuck in there along with, you know, miscellaneous other critters that happen to get stuck. Here's a couple more pictures. You have a couple questions from the chat. Oh, question, okay. Um, how often do you need to reapply the Tanglefoot product? Um, the trick is to put it on, to, the, 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 when you first put it on, you want to wait until the leaves are down. That's pretty important, otherwise, um, you know, you'll get it up there and the next day it'll just be covered in leaves and, and, and the moths will be able to just walk across it when they come out. And they typically come out after the leaves are down anyway. And so put it up after the leaves are down so that it doesn't get a lot of debris. And then we haven't reapplied it yet. It stays sticky. It's waterproof. Um, just last week, we went back and had to, um, you know, tighten up some of the bands that, that had gotten a little saggy or, or um, torn or something like that. Um, and so, so we have done a little bit of maintenance, you know, just recently, um, to just to keep them tight so they can't wiggle under as easily and things like that. Um, but the material stays sticky really indefinitely as long as it's not covered in debris. Now, when we were getting, you know, 700 every three days, um, you can quickly reach a point where there's so many bodies on there that it creates a bridge and new ones can just walk across. And so, you know, we were picking them off each time because we wanted to count them. Um, I'm sure my technician didn't really want to count them, but he did count them. And um, so we were picking them off each time. So each each week we would we would clean off all the bodies. But if you just left them up without doing that, then you would have to just check on the strips to make sure that um, they weren't completely covered, which would make them not sticky anymore. Does that make sense? Um, and uh, yeah, Barbara made a comment, Tanglefoot is at Amazon, Home Depot, um, all over. So we buy in big like five gallon buckets, but most people wouldn't need that much. Um, so we, we're working on this canker worm project trying to, trying to understand more about the biology and management of these guys. Uh, when they came out last year, and reporters were calling me and, and agents were calling me and landscapers were calling me, you know, I realized that we really don't know a lot about these, these, uh, these guys. And so, you know, just even being able to predict when those first moths come out, we, can, we don't know that. We don't have a degree day model or anything. So, so we're working on trying to be able to predict that better. We're measuring the efficacy of these sticky bands um, on trees, and so we and so we have trees with bands and without bands, and trees that even have two bands. And then um, there's a undergraduate who's doing his honors thesis in my lab, and he's going to count, you know, how many eggs are in each tree, how many caterpillars hatch from each tree. Um, and how much defoliation occurs to look at um, just to be able to recommend to people if you put in the time to to install these bands, you can expect this much change in defoliation. Um, and so so we're working away on that, and it's it's been a fun project so far. And um, you know for folks who want more about this this critter, there is, uh, you can visit my website 
for more. And um, there's a couple articles that we've written that are posted up there. We had another article come out today in American Nurserymen on canker worms. Um, and then, of course, there's all manner of other information up on the website also um, that you could use. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to, to entertain them. Tech has a question about the eggs. Oh, okay. Um, are the swirls under the adult the eggs in the photo on the right? Yes. So the in the photo that's up now, um, let's see. So I've got two windows here somehow. Anyway, in the photo that's up now, you see the wingless adult, and then let me see if I can grab one of these icons. Um, um, oh, here we go. Is this the so here's eggs that that finger is, is pointing to. So those are eggs in that photo. And then if we go back a couple pictures, um, there's no eggs that I see in this one or this one. But they will, when you see them on that goop, they will start laying eggs once they realize they're stuck. They'll just start pumping out eggs. And so it's not uncommon to find um, stuck canker worms that have a lot of eggs behind them. Um, what plant materials do they prefer and how extensive can the damage become? So they feed on a, a lot of different deciduous trees, oaks, maples, hickories. Um, you know, they've been reported on cottonwoods and, um, you know, where those are common. It seems like in Raleigh and in North Carolina they seem to prefer we find them most on willow oaks, and of course that's one of the most common trees, so it's probably one that we notice the most. But even on campus, when I would look at willow oaks and other oak trees, it seems like they were most abundant on willow oaks. Um, you know, damage can range from, you know, very little bit of defoliation if the tree is in an area where there weren't many canker worms, where there weren't many adults to lay eggs. Um, but, you know, I don't think we had any trees completely defoliated on campus. We had some that were 50% or so. But in Durham and Charlotte and other places, there was definitely complete defoliation of some trees. And so um, trees can tolerate this for a year or two, but if it keeps up, then you could really um, reduce the, the health or even kill that tree after several years of defoliation. Um, we attached the tape, actually you can see in this picture, we attached the tape with staples. Um, <coughs> if you have something that you can pull tighter, um, you know, you could really get away with, with not using staples. Um, I've seen people use strips of fiberglass insulation that they wrap around the tree and then, you know, make that sort of make that tight around the tree with duct tape or packing tape or something. Um, the the reason they use that insulation is that it sort of nestles into all the nooks and crannies of the bark so that the moths can't wiggle under there. Um, but we we just put in a few few staples from a staple gun and that seemed to secure it pretty well. Any other questions? Okay, well, if you think of things, oh, any control recommendations? Well, this is it. I mean, this is the main control recommendation. Um, what uh, you know, BT can be applied after the eggs hatch. Um, and so BT is, is, is the other chemical that folks have used or, you know, product that folks have used to try and control canker worms after they hatch. The problem is that they only feed for four to six weeks and usually by the time people notice them and notice the damage, 
they're basically done for the year. And so control at that point is really um, futile because, the, because they're done. You're not going to change the damage that occurred. So if you watch the eggs and get them as soon as they hatch, then you can use BT if you've got the application equipment. Again, I mean, a lot of these trees are 80 feet tall, and so um, you'd have to have pretty, um, um, you know, industrial equipment to, to actually make the applications. How important are they as a source of food for birds? Uh, Caterpillars in general are a very important source for birds and um, there's been some great work done by Doug Landis up at Delaware, I mean not Doug Landis, um, Doug Tallamy up at, up at Delaware and, and other folks and you know and they've found that when you have more caterpillars in spring you get bigger clutches of, of baby birds and greater survival of, of songbird chicks and things like that. So, you know, insects in general are super important uh, source of food for birds. Uh, most birds eat, eat more insects and feed their young more insects rather than seeds. And, and so they are important for that reason. And the birds do get a benefit from years when these are super abundant. Um, question about dormant oil. Um, I don't know if dormant oil has any real effect on them. Um, I wouldn't expect it to be super effective. What we would like to try though is spraying trees to see if uh, dormant oil will kill the eggs. And so we'd like to go out after the eggs are laid and spray trees with dormant oil because I imagine that oil would actually suffocate the eggs. Um, and you could really get some some benefit that way, uh, but we haven't tested it yet, and I don't know anyone who has. So stay tuned for that. We're going to try, you know, some other things as the year goes on. Um, you know, uh, just for for other management tactics, but that is one we would like to to try out. When dealing with homeowners, what kind of threshold level should Should we use um, before recommending a control measure? <coughs> well, um, the, the the issue I think with this is is again that by the time most homeowners are going to notice and that their trees are defoliated and that the caterpillars are starting to dangle down on their threads basically it's almost over, right? And so recommending anything at that point is not, is not going to change their situation. Um, the best thing to recommend would be that, you know, based on the biology of these, if you have canker worms one year, all those canker worms are spending the summer under your tree and they're going to lay their eggs in the same tree next year. So you know if you have them one year, you're going to have them the next year. And so you can prepare and put up your sticky bands um, because you're definitely going to have them again. They don't, they don't move. They stay in the same tree for, for year after year after year. So um, the best thing to do would be to recommend that they prepare for next year so that they can get their sticky bands up and um, you know, and make a difference that way. You know, if they're if they're desperate to do something, I, there's really nothing that a homeowner can do on most large street trees that these that these critters are going to be feeding on. There's just not a homeowner um, product, or they don't have the equipment to to make applications to these trees. Um, so that sort of you know doesn't help a lot, but really there's there's not much that they can do except ban their trees. Any others?
Great. Well, thanks, guys. And I did. I can't remember if I brought up the final slide here. Um, you know, I send out um, pest alerts via Twitter, and the way that these work is. You know, as the season progresses, I keep track of degree day accumulation, and I monitor pests on campus and around Raleigh. And when I see things starting to hatch, or I see, you know, a stage of a pest is present that, that needs control, then I send out alerts via Twitter. And um, and so these are really useful you know, to landscape managers, but they've also been useful to agents because it gives them a heads up of what people are going to start to to come in with or call or or have problems with. And so if you want to sign up for those, I think last year I sent out, you know, um, 60 or so alerts saying, you know, Euonymus scale is hatching this week, canker worms are out this week or, or whatever. Um, but we keep track of a lot of different pests and um, and send out alerts to help people be prepared for what's going on in the landscape and nursery. Um, can I clarify uh, the tangle foot bands? Will it grip a bird? Um, I've never heard of it gripping a bird. I mean, it's sticky to the point that you know leaves will stick to it and. Um, you know things like that. It doesn't wash off your hands easily, but it's it's not like uh, it's not sticky the way a glue trap is. You know if you've ever used a glue trap for mice and you know the mice is really stuck on there forever. It's not sticky like that. It's got the consistency of petroleum jelly, um, but a little bit stickier so that it catches bugs, but you're not going to have birds and squirrels and chipmunks and, and the neighbor's cat stuck on there. Um, it's not quite that sticky. But I wouldn't get it on yourself. Um, what areas of the state are they most prominent? They seem to be, you know, I've gotten reports, you know, this spring when I, or in, and winter when I've been going around doing extension talks about this. They seem to be about everywhere. I know Charlotte has tons of them. Um, uh, Durham had, had a lot last year. Raleigh had a lot. But out in the western part of the state, um, when I was in, uh, oh, what town was it? Anyways, out in the western part of the state, they're also very common. So, um, you know, this is this is a native insect. It lives it lives everywhere that it seems like its its host plant is present. The other thing we're trying to understand is is why you see so many more in urban areas compared to, uh, you know, in natural areas. And that's a big focus of our lab in general. And so we're working on that for canker worms also. Leatherford 10, that's where I was a few weeks ago. And they definitely have them out, out there. Any others? I don't know if I have another. Oh, so here's a slide of my web page. If you go there, um, you know there's a, a link for extensions. Um, um, you know other publications and and things you can find there. A list of all the Twitter alerts that we've sent out. Um, and so there's we try and keep it we try and keep it updated. Okay, well, if, if that's Stephen all, Frank, uh, thank you very much for being thanks here. Thanks for thanks for inviting me, and um, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Next up, we've got Showstoppers. Dr. Stephen Frank, thank you we very have much. Somebody from here. the Showstopper You're team. You're very welcome. Thank you. This morning, who wants to talk about Showstoppers? Next up, we've got Showstoppers. Scanning through the list, and don't see Mark Blevins or John Vining. Cindy. Um, I don't know what was supposed to be said, but I am on the Showstoppers team. We have selected our plants for this year, and if you want um, the publications, if you would contact um, John Bynes 
and he will um, make sure that you get some, especially if you have uh, gardening presentations or open houses or exhibits or whatever coming up in your county. Okay, thank you, Cindy. Next up, we've got Dr. Ben Chapman and, and Ashley Chavitz to speak with us about food safety in school and community gardens. Dr. Chapman is an assistant professor and extension food safety specialist. He was born in Toronto, Canada, and grew up in, in the agricultural town of, of Port Hope, Ontario. He completed his bachelor's, his master's, and his PhD at the University of Guelph. Ben develops and evaluates educational programs that focus on safe food handling from farm to fork. Much of this focus is on engaging audiences through various media with the aim of creating and fostering a good food safety culture. Ben develops food safety info sheets that are available on his blog. They summarize foodborne illness, outbreaks, or incidents supplemented with surprising messages and graphics. And since 2007, he's been blogging about food safety on his BARF blog. His site averages about 1,800 unique visitors a day and is a place where food safety researchers provide brief commentary on worldwide food safety happenings. Ben, welcome. Thank you so much, Lucy. Sorry I uh, missed my mark on hitting the button for talking. Um, uh, thanks uh, again for the invite. What I want to share with uh, everyone today is uh, a publication um, that uh, a group of us uh, collaboratively put together on um, uh, food safety practices for school and community gardens. And, and just to give you all a little bit of a history uh, on this, uh, I've worked with uh, the Department of Public Instruction uh, around food safety issues for the past couple of years. And this is something um, that has come up uh, with uh, schools specifically uh, across the state. Uh, there, there seems to be a little bit of um, uh, a uh, situation where there's some tension between those who run the gardens and those who um, uh, run the cafeteria system. Uh, so what what we were kind of called on or what we kind of saw in this situation was uh, to a, a gap in the information and knowledge that was out there around how to address food safety concerns in a garden system. Um, and really what we've done here is uh, apply good agricultural practices to um, to a garden. And so I'm going to I've typed uh, a um, link in the uh, chat box here and I will just hit uh, enter. If you want to uh, click on that, you can download the document that we created um, and uh, follow along as, as I talk about uh, things uh, today. Um, this uh, this document uh, has been available um, for the for about uh, four or five months uh, and has gone through a couple of iterations. But what you see is is a um, something that we're we're pretty happy with um, and. What you know, really, the the objective of creating this was to set to put together a, a set of best practices. Um, there had been some information um, from USDA uh, around um, school gardens, uh, really just saying things like, "Hey, you should worry about your water. Um, hand washing is important." And what we wanted to do was was create a document that that we could put in the hands of actual. Uh, garden managers, volunteers uh, who are looking to to employ uh, best practices. So that's that's what this is kind of all about. Um, and I'm happy to take questions as we go along. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes to give you uh, 10, 15 minutes to give you a little bit of background. Then I'm going to pass things on to Ashley Chaffetz, um, who's a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill, who has worked on this project. And in fact, what you what you see in, in this document is really the the fruits of her labor. She's been the the driving force behind this. Um, she's going to talk to you. Uh, a little bit about a project that, that we've completed or sorry been conducting uh, over the last year where we've worked with gardens to employ uh, these practices so we can get a, a better understanding about uh, where some of the barriers are and, and really how workable um, the best practices are. Um, 
just to, to give you a, a very quick background on food safety and, and why, why I think this is uh, such an important document and an important thing to, to focus on is because we have a lot of foodborne illness uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, our, our best estimates uh, suggest that um, we see about one in six people in the U.S. or in North Carolina uh, are going to get foodborne illness uh, each year. Um, you calculate that out to about 48 million cases of foodborne illness annually. 127,000 hospitalizations and 3,000 deaths. So to me, and, and I'm a, a little bit biased since I'm a food safety specialist, um, this, is, uh, this is kind of a big deal. Uh, the cost to society is also quite high, uh, anywhere between $250 billion and $1.4 trillion a year. And when I say foodborne illness, the, just so, so we're all on the same page with definitions here, this is really um, uh, e. coli, salmonella, hepatitis A, norovirus, uh, things that you may see in the media or have heard about, these aren't um, sort of chronic long-term long illnesses uh, often. It's very acute, um, uh, you know, a little bit of vomit and, and diarrhea. Um, for the most part, people get over it very relatively quickly, but as you can see uh, from our real statistics um, or real uh, confirmed illnesses, we do have you know, over, over 125,000 hospitalizations a year. And, and these happen um, all too often. I can tell you about uh, six or seven outbreaks that are going on right now. Why does this matter for gardens? Well, um, of the outbreaks that we've recorded in the last 15 years, almost half of them, 46%, have been linked to fresh fruits and vegetables. So fresh fruits and vegetables from the uh, Center for Disease Control standpoint um, are the areas that we are, are the, um, the commodity groups that we're concerned about the most uh, just because they've been linked to the, you know, this vast number of, of outbreaks. Um, and, and it's not, you know, as a, uh, as a food microbiologist, it's not all that surprising uh, to look at that. It, the, the biggest reason is fresh fruits and vegetables are eaten raw. And in fact, that's, that's great. That's the very nature of what makes them tasty to me and, and healthy uh, to, to many is that they're, they're not um, processed whatsoever. But the, the risk is that anything that comes in contact with them from really um, you know, when they're planted uh, all the way through to, to when they're eaten or served uh, can be the source of foodborne illness. So there's no um, inherent step in fresh fruit and, uh, and production, or fresh fruit and vegetable production that kills pathogens. Um, our, our goal with this document, is, you know, and, and sort of everything that, that we do and, and provide and, you know, the, the philosophy of extension, as, as everyone knows, is, is all about um, evidence-based systems, evidence-based strategies, and, and what uh, the document that you, that you see in front of you is really based on uh, a concept of food, something called food safety culture. Um, food safety culture is, is really the idea, it's kind of like um, organizational behavior uh, a little bit, but it's, it's this idea that everyone within a system has a, a shared understanding and a shared value set around uh, something, and in this case, food safety. So it's, you know, that uh, everyone knows about the hazards associated with growing leafy greens in a garden, everyone that's involved with that garden, and they all have a hand to play in reducing those risks. And so uh, that, that's kind of the philosophy behind this, uh, this document. It's not just to provide, hey, here are the risks that you need to worry about. It's, it's about how, how can someone employ these practices? How do you work with volunteers uh, within a garden um, to, to help them understand uh, risks so you can build this idea of a um, positive food safety culture. And, and it is, I mean, you can have a, a very good food safety culture and you can have a very bad food safety culture, and these things can be applied to um, gardens just as easily as they can be to you know, large production or processing uh, environments. There, there, there's some measurable culture out there. So that's what we, we kind of focus on. Um, just to give you a, 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 a real life um, recent example of what you know? What, what's the big deal here? Um, there was a, a large outbreak that happened in 2011 that was linked to cantaloupe production in Colorado. Um, 33 deaths associated with uh, fresh cantaloupes, rock melon uh, cantaloupes uh, from listeria. There was 146 illnesses, um, and no one really kind of 
focused on, um, you know, when this outbreak happened, we didn't really focus on what what were the the problems that um, that occurred, what were the factors that led to it. It really had to do with, well, who was checking what and what was being employed. And, and really, um, what we have in the document around good agricultural practices uh, has been known in the food safety community uh, for for 15 years. Uh, there's really nothing, um, uh, you know, cutting edge in there. It, it's really the same factors that pop up every time we have an outbreak. What we're trying to do is repackage that for a, a different type of audience. Um, this is a, a picture that Ashley actually uh, took at um, the Carborough Farmers Market uh, of uh, following that outbreak of uh, listeria in, in cantaloupes of uh, someone who was advertising that their cantaloupes were absolutely positively listeria free, and and I'll tell you as, as a food microbiologist that that there's no one can make that claim um, whatsoever. What we can talk about is, you know, am I reducing risk? Am I addressing the hazards in my production environment, and in our case today, garden uh, environment, to effectively reduce risk? Because there is nothing that is absolutely absolutely positively listeria free in the world of fresh fruits and vegetables. It's just sort of a magnitude uh, and can I reduce it to, to levels which are not uh, problematic. Um, I want to show you a couple of more a couple more outbreaks. Um, and these have to do these relate directly to, to practices that we um, have seen and, and um, focused on uh, in our gardens project. Uh, in 2000, uh, there was an E. coli outbreak linked to uh, a farmers market in Fort Collins, Colorado, um, and uh, the outbreak uh, led to 14 illnesses and two hospitalizations. Both the hospitalizations were children who had. Um, hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is a complication that happens from E. coli, 0157H7 affects the kidneys. Um, and uh, in this situation, why I highlight this is because the outbreak was actually not linked to, to any production practices or anything like that. It was really linked to poor sampling uh, practices. The um, uh, producer in question who was linked to this outbreak um, was uh, reported to investigators that he, he did not um, clean or sanitize uh, a knife uh, that he used to cut up all of his uh, cantaloupe samples uh, and provide them free of charge to, um, to patrons in that market, um, and, and in fact couldn't report how long it had been since he had cleaned and sanitized it, so there was a potential for biofilms uh, on, that, on those knives or on that knife. And the other thing that um, uh, that you reported doing was uh, cutting up melons uh, well before service time or you know when he was doing his, his sampling and holding them uh, at ambient temperatures um, and so there was growth and, and the reason why I bring this up and why we focus on, on this is um, for our work with with gardens you know the, the very benefit of gardens what we want people to be able to do is to, to eat and sample what's been grown um, and and what we found in um, in school systems, at least anecdotally, is that uh, often uh, someone may harvest a, a product, they may take it into a classroom and use it throughout the day, um, you know, cut it up, use it throughout the day as, as a, a taste test, um, and then um, provide, you know, provided those um, uh, you know, samples and, and maybe not um, controlled for, for risks and, and growth. So what we wanted to highlight uh, here was that, you know, these are the types of things that, that happen. Um, the second outbreak I want to show you is really about small um, production systems, uh, an outbreak that happened in 2011, um, also involving E. coli L157H7, linked to strawberries um, sold at multiple farm stands in Oregon. And um, although this outbreak was really interesting from a, you know, being able to trace product um, situation, what I really want to focus on here is the, this not just theoretical potential that wildlife can impact um, uh, you know, garden systems or small production systems, but in this case, the outbreak was linked um, directly to a wild deer population near this uh, strawberry producer's um, farm, and investigators ended up pulling the outbreak strain directly out of feces that had been deposited in the strawberry field uh, by that by deer. Um, and you know, this is we've worked for the last two years with um, you know, 35 plus gardens across North Carolina, a common um, 
problem that, that we hear is, hey, there's a lot of wildlife that eat our stuff, so how do we, help, how do we keep them out? And, and in fact, this has a, a, a large food safety component um, as well. Uh, and kind of the, I guess, what put fresh produce food safety on the map is this large outbreak um, that happened in 2006 linked to uh, spinach, also E. coli 15787. The message I want to tell you about this is um, after sort of calculating this, you know, 200 people sick, three deaths, um, after calculating back what might have caused this outbreak, um, there was a paper that was published about four years ago uh, that suggested about 400 grams of uh, pig feces that would have been uh, from a pig that might have been, uh, been a carrier of this E. coli uh, strain really was what could have caused this outbreak, this widespread outbreak. So one small pig event, uh, pig poop event in a, in a garden, uh, you know, a feral pig uh, can lead to to an outbreak. So it doesn't take a lot of contamination. Is is what we've what we've seen from uh, outbreaks in the past. Um, just uh, you know, stuff. After working in food safety for the last 15 years, um, I've heard a lot of uh, you know, I guess, different myths about who's who's most at risk. And, and as I mentioned, fresh fruits and vegetables being the, the number one source of foodborne illness. Um, you know, not being a vegetarian is not a protect, protective uh, factor. Um, and, and really, that's you know, what what we're trying to do is is um, get good risk reduction information in the hands of folks that can um, really employ it. Um, bacteria don't don't care um, where their you know where where food's being grown. They don't really care about um, local food systems or whether it's a garden. We we don't know um, you know just uh, data wise. I'm a I'm a data nerd. Um, we we don't have any data uh, on garden microbiological um, contamination um, that you know that I'm aware of anything that's been published in the literature where anyone's sort of gone out and done a survey we have pretty decent uh, you know 10 years 15 years worth of data on fresh fruits and vegetables in general in production systems we know um, that on average it's between half a percent and one and a half percent of uh, commodities um, will have contamination so you know, sort of extrapolating some of that data, we may think that um, garden systems may be at about the same level. We really just don't know. Um, so what what we do know are, and, and what this package uh, is based on, are, are the factors that do lead to fresh to um, foodborne illness that we have seen from other outbreaks. But uh, I wish we we had some really great data that that could show um, us where to focus on more in gardens. We just uh, haven't generated it, and it's not available. Um, I already talked a little bit about that. I just want to sort of go through um, where contamination can happen in this farm to fork, garden to fork continuum. Um, there's absolutely a, a potential for um, contamination at pre-harvest, harvest, harvest uh, processing and storage, and, and post-harvest. And um, we've really focused in, in our document here on um, you know raw production, pre-harvest uh, uh, areas, and, and in harvest. Um, the processing and storage we, we allude to a little bit, but it's not uh, a main focus uh, for us uh, here. We wanted to, to sort of fill, there's a lot of information already out there on um, sort of the post-harvest handling of fresh fruits and vegetables. What we were missing was around uh, pre-harvest with, with gardens. Um, last slide I want to show you uh, before I pass things on to Ashley is really the, the, the history on, on this project and, and the framework that we use for, for everything that we develop. It's, it's really um, for us to get a sense of what the practices are. What are the um, what are the behaviors that are out there working with the, that target group? And as I mentioned, we worked with um, 35 plus uh, gardens uh, uh, um, community and school gardens in rural and urban uh, settings across the state, um, primarily uh, focused um, you know, closer to us in, in the triangle for this, this small study, but um, have, have gotten uh, a good handle on the varying uh, landscape of, of how uh, gardens are run and, and some of their production practices. We took that information to develop the intervention that, we, that you have in front of you. Um, 
and uh, the what uh, what Ashley's going to talk about is a little bit of, of some also reality based research working directly back with those with another set of gardens to understand how they employ stuff uh, as part of an evaluation. This sort of is an iterative process. So what you have today is um, you know iteration two uh, of this document. Um, and we anticipate that, that other iterations will pop up uh, as we go along. So uh, I'm going to step off the microphone here and, and pass things over to Ashley to, uh, to talk about the specifics in the document. Hi, um, I'm Ashley Chaffetz. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, first about how we put the document together. Um, what's in the document, and then how we evaluated it. Okay. So first what happened is that in 2011, 2012, we visited about 41 gardens um, in Wake, Orange, and Durham County counties. Uh, just, uh, you know, focusing on those counties because they're near to us. Um, and recognizing that there are many similarities with gardens in other parts of the state, um, but also that there are a handful of differences. Um, but what we really did here was find this, recognize this issue, go to these gardens, and just kind of like learn about the story of the garden, like what is going on out there. Um, and um, you know, learn that some gardens don't have access to water sources, and so they bring it all in in jugs, or that, you know, the school gardens all have access to the bathroom, but never on the weekends, things like that. Um, and so then once we learned all these stories of the gardens, uh, we uh, read a lot of academic literature, talked to a lot of experts, soil scientists, vegetable specialists, youth development folks, um, and then wrote up this document and then went back out to these garden managers and talked to them. I'm like, you know, if this, if we said, you know, you should take the temperature of your compost, would you always do it or never do it or somewhere in the middle? Um, and then edited a lot, um, trying to get a, a good grasp on uh, coming up with Apply, putting these best practices in a document, but also making them available in a way that people would actually uh, do them. Okay, so we identified, and much like in the uh, GAP standards, um, the key areas of risk uh, and best garden practices, site selection, water, compost, animals, hand washing, sanitation, and tools. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk a little bit about is site selection. And you can see in the document that for each uh, of these points, there's a green uh, dot and a yellow dot. And the green dot is really the best practice. Um, the yellow dot, however, is the we know that you can't do the green dot, but here's the next best thing you can do, um, uh, knowing that you are mitigating risk more than if you weren't doing either of them. Um, so the first one we looked at is site selection. Uh, what's the safety risk? Um, not knowing the history of the site, what could have been there already? Um, does the site get a lot of flooding? Are there always animals there? Um, but with the best practice being like getting the history of the site from planning officials. But if you, if you can't get any sort of official uh, information, just even asking around and trying to learn from the community what was there before, um, it could be incredibly helpful. Next is hand washing, um, safety risk being that um, the spread of potentially harmful microorganisms. Um, the uh, CDC estimates that about 50% of foodborne illnesses are linked to poor hand washing. Um, and so we have here uh, the best way to lower the risk is to wash your hands with uh, soap and clean running water and dry them with uh, single use towels. Um, but recognizing that we've run into gardens that don't have running water, um, we're suggesting as a next best practice um, to uh, wear disposable single-use gloves, or if the task is maintenance only, you could wear uh, the traditional garden gloves. Garden gloves, excuse me. Okay. 
sorry, water. Um, so the best the the best way to minimize the risk when we're talking about water um, is to use a regulated, treated water source. Um, there are a lot of gardens that are using a variety of different um, water sources, from uh, the municipal water to uh, well water to collected water in a cistern or other kind of catchment system. Um, and recognizing that if you're not using the uh, municipal water source, uh, the best practice would then be to have that water tested and make sure it's up to standards, before, up to EPA standards before you actually use it for watering or washing. The idea that if you wouldn't drink it, you probably shouldn't put it on the plants, not the edible plants, at least, only the ornamentals. Um, we also address in the document, we get a lot of questions about like what kind of watering is the best. Like should you use a hose or drip irrigation or uh, watering cans, things like that. Um, really the best practice is to uh, reduce the amount of water that's put on the edible portion of the plant. Um, drip irrigation is pretty awesome, especially because it can be timed, um, but recognizing that it's also uh, pricey for some of the um, garden managers. Um, the question about the paper towels for drying hands be composted, yes. Um, I think it depends on the kind of paper towels. I think they have to be the unbleached paper towels um, uh, to that if you really to really want to put them in the compost. Um, there is a list of compostable stuff in our compost section. And if you uh, are looking at the online version of the document, there should be also a link to uh, a list of um, stuff from the EPA that they say is good to compost. But yes, I have seen gardens that are using the uh, brown uh, paper towels and composting them. That brings us to compost. That was so well timed. Um, so compost actually has a couple of different risks. Um, the it, and it all goes it goes back to one idea. One is that if it hasn't gotten to 130 degrees Fahrenheit for at least three days, it could have pathogens. It is likely to have pathogenic bacteria. Um, and so what you want to know is that before you put this compost back into your garden, to before you actually use it, that it has um, it is cooked. Um, and so what we're suggesting here is that uh, the garden managers have a, uh, it's a very long stemmed thermometer that you stick inside and uh, registers to at least 130. Five days, I meant five days, I'm sorry. Um, and if the compost, and so the other, the other, uh, sorry, the other, um, issue there is where is the compost located. Um, given that in North Carolina we tend to get a lot of rains and flooding, um, we would uh, suggest that the compost is as far from the garden and uh, uphill as, as, as is feasible. Um, you don't want to put it too far away to where nobody ever uses it, um, but that it is, uh, sorry, downhill from the garden, I'm sorry. Um, and so this way, in the event of flooding, the uh, contents of the compost don't actually uh, flood into the garden itself. Animals, um, we know that the animals pose two issues. One, that they will eat all of your harvest but also that they will poop in your garden. And so the best way to keep them out of the garden is to uh, have a fence. Um, and uh, to keep deer out, you would probably need a fence that's about eight feet tall. I've seen a lot of uh, ruined fences from deer uh, jumping over and crashing into it. Um, but if, if, a, if a fence is out of the question, and it certainly is for some of the school gardens, there are, you know, repellents and sprays and certain uh, uh, plants that can be used to try to keep the uh, animals out. But also not having things like bird feeders in the garden or near the garden so that that way they won't congregate there and poop all over your uh, 
harvest. Okay, sanitation and tools. Uh, this one, oh, what about the chicken coops? Okay, so we haven't seen a lot of chicken coops with the school gardens um, and few actually with the community garden, so I have seen a couple. Um, the best idea there is to have the chicken coops completely contained separately um, from the garden, but also if possible to have special footwear that you wear while you're inside, if you're in like a gated chicken area, um, so that that way you then don't track, track the chicken poop into the garden. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering that question completely, but... Um, yeah, and Ashley, I'll just um, add on to that, that the um, sort of raw chicken uh, manure does carry a risk, and so that it would be uh, composted um, absolutely before use. And, and we've, we've kind of addressed this a little bit in the document where we really discourage gardens from using raw uh, animal manure just because it is a higher risk uh, um, uh, soil amendment. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, so, uh, sanitation and tools. Uh, the two green dots here are not a mistake. Um, the best practice is to wear single-use gloves um, when you're harvesting and to put the harvest into clean, sanitized containers. If you're not wearing single-use gloves, equally as effective is to wash your hands before harvesting. Um, and if you're and and if and if they get contaminated, to certainly wash them again. Um, but also, um, if you're uncertain about when those containers were last washed, to put the harvest into new plastic bags. Um, and we see the plastic bags especially a lot with the school gardens, because they will, a lot of them will bag it directly from the um, garden and send it to the classrooms and home, things like that. Um, Okay, so that leads us to like how, like what what I did last summer. Um, so last summer we visited 28 new gardens from the original uh, group that um, helped us to create the document and asked a whole bunch of different questions. Um, and so what we did is that we went through and visited these gardens, asked them a series of questions, talked to them about the stuff that's in the document, and then went back uh, two to three months later to see how things were going. Um, uh, you know, did they choose to implement any of the stuff we were suggesting? Did they think it was garbage? Did they think it was awesome? Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. And it's all based on the, the uh, good agricultural practices from USDA. Okay, so what's happening in this picture? There's a lot of things going on. Um, some gardens <laughs> don't really know uh, the risks. Uh, food safety isn't necessarily on their radar. They're mostly thinking about growing things. Um, and it doesn't, this wasn't a suggestion that like, uh, Nobody knew anything about food safety, but just that it probably it we found it was not at the top of the everyone's list. Okay, so in that evaluation, we learned a couple of things. Um, first one is about hand washing. So of the twenty gardens that we were able to visit twice, um, we learned that seven of the school gardens were able to adopt the pre-harvest hand washing. Uh, the schools have this luxury of having water and soap and paper towels already provided to them, and so it's a bit easier for them to make that change. Um, in terms of the composting, we had quite a few uh, gardens actually move their compost bins to a different location in the garden. Um, as well as um, getting a compost thermometer and taking the temperature of the garden, uh, of the compost. Um, they, for the school gardens, they would often work it into the lesson. Um, 
uh, sanitation. Uh, we didn't see any uh, people get worse at sanitation, luckily. Um, but three gardens chose to begin to use single-use plastic bags for harvesting, and four began actually washing and sanitizing the harvest containers. Um, uh, you know, just finally thinking about the fact that maybe they had never wash them. We learn that a lot. Um, okay, the water source. Oh, um, this actually, well, I'm going to come back to this one. Okay, so manager behavior um, is really like uh, uh, looking at does the garden manager, um, is the garden manager an example? Um, are they setting an example for the other people, which we have found uh, to be uh, a pretty, <laughs> a pretty incredible um, mover? That if the garden manager is, you know, doing all these things, then the other garden participants participants were likelier to uh, do them as well. And then the last one has to do with order of operations. Uh, the gardens that have the have any sort of rules. Um, be likely, they're likelier to get followed. Um, but in terms of uh, order of operations, in things like hand washing, we learned that if they just change the way that they uh, operate, like everybody washes their hands first, and then we harvest, and then we do other garden chores. Um, yes, dish soap and water. Uh, well, no, you actually need to use a, um, like a bleach solution to uh, clean the harvesting containers. So you can also put them in the dishwasher, and the dishwasher would be uh, equal to sanitizing them. The but the bleach solution is only one teaspoon per gallon of water um, to uh, sanitize. Yeah, and let me, um, Ashley, let me just jump in to clarify yeah. there. Um, the dish soap and water would be absolutely good enough to clean the containers. What Ashley's talking about is a post-cleaning step of sanitation. Um, you can't just um, add in a sanitizer to a dirty container because the, the chlorine or whatever you're using as a sanitizer will get bound up by the organic matter. So, yeah, it's fine to clean using the dish, dish soap and water, um, but then a post-cleaning sanitation step is, is the best practice. Um, I'm going to talk about the issues with the water source it also in the difficult to change. So I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Um, this one is a early some early results on our hand washing uh, responses. Um, you can series one really means first visit, and series two means second visit. Um, but like improvements in even just using hand sanitizer or single-use gloves, making that available to the gardeners. Uh, hand sanitizer is not as good as hand washing, um, though it would be better than nothing at all. Um, but you can see this like shift in um, gardeners being required to wash their hands before um, harvesting produce. And trying to make the bathrooms uh, more accessible for the school gardens, it's sometimes just the uh, trying to get a key to the school on the weekend. Um, or for the community gardens, we've seen it uh, more of like acquiring the, uh, uh, like the picture in the beginning, like the use your foot or the, I feel like there's a bunch of names for those uh, portable water uh, <laughs> contraptions with the barrels on top. Um, so it's, the hand washing has actually been pretty awesome. Difficult to change. Now, obviously, we knew that this could not, this would not be perfect. Um, things that are really hard are building a fence. Um, a lot of garden managers see that as a barrier. Oh, that just changed back. Okay. <laughs> um, difficult to change the building a fence. Um, it seems to be. Uh, they see it as fairly, it can be fairly costly, but we've also seen gardens who've had, you know, tons of bamboo donated um, or um, gotten a grant just for such a thing. But it's not something that happens as quickly um, to, as, um, 
as hand washing. So the question that we're looking at now is about keeping the barrel sanitized, which is actually the next thing I'm going to talk about. So rain barrel testing has proven to be one of the hardest things um, for uh, the garden managers to change. Um, to, <laughs> to keep the barrel sanitized, it's the same in that you would have to use um, a sanitizing solution or a bleach solution um, to sanitize the barrels themselves. But then as it collects water, you would actually need to test the water um, themselves. Now the photograph that I have here um, is part of a, is from a school garden that has 16 of these. Um, and so to uh, test these uh, rain barrels for just generic E. coli, they would actually have to take a sample from each of the barrels, um, which has proven to be a difficult to change kind of uh, thing here um, to the point where um, I think that a lot of uh, school and community gardens are considering just using the rain barrels, uh, the water from the rain barrels for the ornamentals and not for the uh, edible plants um, because of the uncertainty of them. Um, and I have more on uh, the uh, rain barrels on the Grower Facing Gardens website, um, and there should be links to like places where you can get the water tested um, and other uh, details. Um, testing for heavy metals in the soil. So this is actually not a difficult thing to do, um, but the state pays for the regular soil test, but heavy metals uh, you have to go to a private uh, company to do that test, and a lot of gardens just haven't taken that step yet. Um, there's also links to that, to where you can get the, do the heavy metals test on the website. And the last question is about irrigation, which I um, uh, brought up earlier about drip irrigation. Like a lot of the gardens want to do the drip irrigation, but uh, it's costly, so they use a hose. Okay, so then there were some surprise questions. Um, the rain barrels, I think we've, and the soil testing we've addressed here um, already. But I got a lot of questions about the compost, um, about is it okay to put nightshades in the compost? It is okay to put nightshades in the compost. About whether black cow is okay to use, um, black cow is okay to use. Um, it's already composted. Uh, the, Black Cow Company or the company that makes Black Cow has already guaranteed its safety. Um, a lot of questions about cold compost or leaf compost, uh, which doesn't necessarily need to have the temperature taken because it doesn't have the same, um, it's not going through the same process, I guess. Um, and then a lot of questions about cafeteria waste. Can I put cafeteria waste into the compost? And the schools that have done this uh, have seemed to find that if you, compost the cafeteria waste from even a small elementary school, you have a lot of waste. Um, so I've seen a lot of gardens that have been like, okay, we'll just take the, um, you know, snack, comp <laughs> the snack waste. Um, how do they maintain the garden all summer? Whereas the community gardens thrive in the summer, the school gardens really struggle with uh, what to do all summer. Uh, and the gardens that have returned to school looking the best, um, have been the school gardens that have a very set schedule about who's going to maintain it, sometimes giving like a family uh, a week and then the next family another week, what have you. Um, and school gardens that even for schools that are year-round schools, they, they struggle with it as well because it gets so hot in the summer they can't take the kids outside. Um, Harvesting plastic bags, containers, and hands, a lot of those, a lot of questions about is it okay to use X, Y, or Z, uh, it is best to harvest into clean hands or wear gloves um, and put them into wash and sanitized containers or fresh plastic bags. Um, and then the last question is really always about how am I going to pay for all these things, Ashley? I can't believe you just suggested I get all of them. I'm really working on compiling, you know, this list of grants. Um, it's on the Growers Growing Safer Gardens website. Um, and 
sometimes I get them from the community gardens listserv and just add them up. But it's, it's not exhaustive, but it's, there are a lot of grants on there. Um, so what are we doing now? Um, now we're actually looking to um, uh, help or assist schools, uh, school gardens who are looking to attempt a GAP certification. And we're really just like the, um, uh, you know, I guess like the, <laughs> the advisors. Uh, we are not performing that certification, um, but uh, helping schools in any way they can because they are interested in selling their harvest to the cafeteria or to other um, like local uh, food purveyors. But also to create like a model so that gardens have this template of what to do and what not to do and so they, so I don't have to do a webinar every single time, something like that. Um, so this is what the website looks like. Um, uh, and if you have any questions about it, of course, myself or Ben Chapman are available. Um, but there's all sorts of all sorts of extra information on there uh, beyond what I'm telling y'all today. And I'm happy to take any questions. If y'all have any. Okay, so well, Ashley, thank you so much for joining us on YouTube, Ben. We really appreciate all of the great work you guys did in compiling this information and, and um, making it available to the school and community gardens across the state and actually across the country. <coughs> great. Um, yeah, happy to be uh, involved, and thanks for the invite. Okay. Next up, we have Mike Munster. Mike works with the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. He diagnoses diseases on ornamentals for commercial clients, such as nurseries and greenhouses. And he's um, been with the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic since 2009. He's got a BS in Agronomy from the University of Minnesota and a Master's from Plant Pathology from NC State. He also teaches a portion of the Turf and Ornamentals Disease course for the NC SU Agricultural Institute, and he's a regular presenter here at Plants, Tests, and Pathogens. Mike, welcome. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, if everyone who can hear me could give me, well, I don't see the checks now for the uh, polling. They were there earlier, and now let's see if we can get those up. Yeah, okay. So yes, green checks coming in. So I assume that those are in response to the fact that you can hear me. Great. I don't know how you folks feel. Not only are those hard acts to follow, but I feel like the kid in the cartoon who has to be excused because his brain is full. So I will try and make this as, as interesting as I can for the last half hour, a little more, that we have here on the show. I'm broadcasting from the clinic itself today. Usually we do this from a room around the corner. But it's been so quiet, and the phone hasn't been ringing, and people haven't been walking in too much. So I'm going to take a chance and just uh, do this from the clinic. I want to start out with a couple of photographs that Danny Lauderdale sent in just this morning. And were these, Danny, from Pitt County, or you sometimes send from Pitt, and I think you sometimes send from one of the other adjacent counties? Is Danny still on the, OK, this from Pitt County. This is a Japanese maple. And the question that the owner had was what was causing this decay at the base. He said that the tree looked good. Apparently, uh, the crown is in good shape and the leaves and so on. But uh, the base looks like this. And I looked at the pictures. Also, Chuck Hodges here consulted with me on them. Here's the other image. And we really can't tell for sure what the original problem was. There's obviously decay going on here, but this could be based on an old injury, which is kind of my favorite theory, based on the hole here and the fact that there is some callousing going on in this 
portion. Uh, there could have been an old canker there as well. But one thing is causing stress to the tree, exacerbating probably the problem, is the fact that you've got this girdling root here and several of these other roots that look like they're trying to girdle the tree. And so the long-term prospects, whatever the original cause were, the long-term prospects for this tree are not good. And both Chuck and I feel that this is something that the uh, best thing to do is remove it. Now, the homeowner may not want to do that as long as it appears to him that it's got a good crown on it. So at the point when it starts declining, then, then he will probably choose to remove that. One thing to be careful of, we don't know if the mulch was removed for the purposes of taking this picture or not, but one risk factor for getting these girdling roots to develop is planting too deep or mulching too deep. I want to start out with a few, not disease situations in particular, but general recommendations for disease prevention on our plants for the new year. Start out with this uh, concept of sanitation pruning. Now, I'm certainly no expert in pruning. I know that there's uh, science and an art to it, and the difference between pruning in the spring, which invigorates, and pruning in the summer, which devigorates, and so forth. But basically, sanitation pruning is something that uh, can be done, as far as I know, any time of year when you've got a canker present or you've got dead limbs present and you want to cut those back. You want to make sure you get all the way, not just down to the base of where the decay or the canker is, but go several inches into clean wood and be sure and sanitize your shears, saws, whatever tools you're using periodically during this process so that you don't spread canker fungi around and so on. Of course, roses should be cut back. Now this will help against canker diseases, but also possibly help reduce problems with rose rosette next year or this year by reducing the mite population. At least I've seen that suggested. Mulching, again, you don't know mulch too deeply. You want to make sure and leave some area of bare soil around the base of trees so that the, um, uh, the roots aren't suffocated there and that moisture can get in. We want to mulch around roses. The picture here doesn't show that very well. And uh, camellias, those are good disease control practices because they will be covering up the inoculum in old dead leaves in the case of the roses or in the case of camellias with the sclerotia of Siberinia that causes petal blight. So you want to make sure you have a good couple of inches of mulch in those situations. Cleaning up and removing dead plant material, you can see a case on the left here where the leaves left on the ground are probably not a good idea for things like black spot if those are the rose leaves coming in then on the new foliage when growth resumes. But on the right we see a good practice here. This variety has been cut back to a couple of inches from the ground. It could maybe be raked out a little bit better there. And that prevents anthracnose from building up in the beds. Many perennials you're going to want to do this kind of clean up your uh, peonies, remove dead leaves from daylilies, irises, all the kind of perennial vegetation that is now dead and could be harboring fungi for the following year. Oh, one other thing about the pruning, be sure to do it wisely in terms of not cutting off already formed buds that you're going to want to give you flowers or fruit for this year. Frost protection, we're not out of the woods. I just was looking at the forecast here in the Raleigh area. There's a chance of rain or snow showers on Saturday. And of course, we all remember the Easter freeze from a couple of years ago. These can cause long-term damage to plants, especially if they're coming out of dormancy and then get hit with a late frost. So be on the lookout for that. Water management, this garden on uh, the picture, in the picture on the right, would uh, be in very bad shape if Phytophthora ever got in there because it would just have a field day with all the moisture that's present after, after a rain like this one. So raising the beds, we saw some beautiful raised beds in the gardens that Ashley was showing in her presentation. And just a reminder that overhead watering on plants will increase leaf wetness and therefore the chance of having both fungal and bacterial diseases. Uh, fruit spray schedule. We tend to discourage the use of fungicides in a lot of cases in landscapes, but when you're dealing with fruits, 
you're going to have to have a pretty good tolerance for disease, uh, blemishes, and so forth if you're not going to use a spray schedule. And the recommendations for disease and insect management in the home orchard were updated just back in October. They're available on the PDIC website when you go to the plant disease fact sheet. So check that out for the uh, latest on disease and insect management in the home orchard. Looking at the vegetable garden, of course, crop rotation is something that is always wise, especially dealing with soil-borne plant pathogens, such as root knot nematodes, shown in the picture here on cucumber roots. Choosing resistant varieties when you've got known disease pressure, and of course, resistant species, avoiding things that are going to be susceptible to what you have. And the very important point of inspecting your transplants, both the roots and the tops, if you're buying plants to go into the garden. We heard uh, word of some cabbage, broccoli, and collard transplants in South Carolina with downy mildew earlier this month. In 2011, we had the scare in South Carolina of downy mildew on squash transplants. And then back in 2009, there was a widespread problem of late blight on tomato transplants. So those are just a few general recommendations for dealing with um, preventing diseases in the coming year. I want to talk a little bit, since what we see on our trees now are a lot of conifers with needles, and the, the deciduous trees are pretty much bare. So I want to talk a little bit about needle blights. And before I even start, I want to give a big thanks to Chuck Hodges, who's sitting just a few feet away from me, for his help in putting this particular section of the presentation together. There are four that we could talk about, and one of them <coughs> was already covered in plant specimen pathogens back in August of 2011. That was Passolora needle blight, which occurs on Leyland cypress, on red cedar, and other Cupressaceae. So I'm not going to repeat anything said there, but we'll talk a little bit about Ployoderma, brown spot needle blight, and Rhizosphere needle cast on conifers. It's an important thing to start out with a couple of sort of caveats. One is remember that needles are not immortal. It's normal for conifers to shed their leaves after they've served them well for two or three years. And this will depend on the tree. And it could be in the fall. It could be in the spring. So the problems that you would worry about would be those that are appearing on the current year's needles, or at this time of year, the needles that were formed last year. That's where we're going to be concerned about these needle cast diseases. I also should point out, before I start, that most of the problems you're going to see on conifer needles from the folks who come to your door are not going to be one of these diseases. There are going to be other factors, and I'll mention a few of those along the way that you might commonly see. The first disease that I want to mention in terms of needle cast is called Ployoderma needle cast. All three of these that I'm going to be talking about are caused by fungi. In this case, the scientific name of the fungus is Ployoderma lethali. It occurs on loblolly and other pines, although Chuck says he hasn't seen it on longleaf. But susceptibility to this disease is quite variable, both among different species and within a species of pine. Most of the symptoms are going to be on the needles of the lower limbs, as you see in this photograph. And the reason for that is because of the humidity that's required to get infection to take place, which is, of course, higher down lower in the canopy. And you can see there's probably not very much air movement uh, in some of the lower canopy in this photograph. Despite the picture here, this disease is more common on 6 to 8 inch diameter trees and even larger. So trees like you would see in the background here would be the ones where you might more likely see Polyoderma needle cast. The infection occurs in this particular case on the emerging needles in the spring. And it's very interesting because the needle will not show symptoms. It'll look fine all the way until, in this area, April of the following year. And that's when it turns brown and drops off. Not much spotting in this case, but you get the general browning of the needle and the needle cast or the needle falling off. 
The fungus will sporulate or produce its spores on dead attached needles. So it's not going to be that helpful to rake up needles in this particular case for this particular disease. And we would not recommend any kind of treatment in the landscape for this disease. All right. Can anyone name this plant? Give you a hint, this is from a sandhills type situation. Yes, this is longleaf pine in the grass stage. For those not familiar with it, the first couple of years of its seedling development, this plant has no elongated stem. It grows white grass in, the, uh, in its native environment. And then only after a few years will the shoots start to elongate. And the disease that I'm about to mention can cause really serious problems on seedlings of longleaf pine. It can slow its development, delay the time at which that stem starts to elongate, and even kill seedlings. In a native or natural situation, fire is quite helpful to the plant in this case because it knocks back the fungus, it burns the needles that have the disease on them, and so we see less of it. And the disease that I'm talking about is known as brown spot needle blight. This is a picture from a sample that Taylor Williams brought in. He sent in the picture first. It comes from Moore County and was seen in February. And we've seen this on more than one sample so far this year. So it is active and occurring right now. This is, uh, I should mention, from a nursery situation. The fungus that causes this disease, brown spot needle blight, is called Mycosphorella dearnesii. You may sometimes see literature or even references that say in a product label for a nursery under the old name of Syria acicola, but it's now called Mycosphorella dearnesii. The most common host in North Carolina is longleaf pine, although it is reported to occur also on Scots pine and Austrian pine, which of course are not native. The symptoms in this case are quite noticeable as yellow or brown spots or bands on the needles. And oftentimes, there's resin exudate on those needles, which I'll show you a photo of in just a second. The tips of the needles can die. And then, of course, the needles can fall off. And it's most damaging, as I already mentioned, to seedlings and saplings of the trees. Here in this case, because of the length of time that spores are being produced on the needles, the uh, there is a potential benefit for keeping those raked up. Can this occur on loblolly pine? I have not seen any of our clinic samples coming in with brown spot needle bite on loblolly. That would more likely get the, the ployoderma. But since Chuck is right here across from me, let me ask Chuck, have you ever seen have you ever seen brown spot needle bite on lob? He says he has not been able to actually definitively confirm brown spot needle blight on loblolly. And uh, that's coming from someone with many, many years in the, in the Forest Service and as a diagnostician. So much better than what I can say. All right. Um, this is another sample that came in this month, this one from Carteret County. And I want to point out the fact that these particular plants also have a general yellowing. That's not the brown spot needle blight symptom. That indicates that there's something else going on here, such as a site problem, a soil problem, or a root problem. And I should mention, too, the fact that, in general, the loblolly pines are going to look a little yellow this time of year. Chuck has explained this to me that it has to do with the type of nitrogen that loblollies prefer to use being in short supply in cold soils. So you could have a lob and a longleaf pine next to each other this time of year, and, and the longleaf looks nice and green, and the lob looks kind of, uh, kind of unhealthy and yellowish. Uh, the question was, how should you dispose of the raked up needles? There, you should be all right uh, in a compost that the uh, once those are decayed, then that fungus should not be a threat any longer to the uh, to the trees around. So you can compost those, or of course bag them up and off to the landfill. I'm I'm being communicated with here from from Chuck. One thing he said he didn't think to mention yesterday when we were talking about this was. Ah, uh, yes.
Okay, yes. Um, an interesting an interesting thought that when you buy pine straw, especially if it's long leaf, you could be bringing the disease into your site on that pine straw. So, um, going back to the sample here, if we look a little bit more closely at it, we can see the yellowing, uh, the bandy, but we can also see those little resin deposits on the spots themselves. This is a good symptom of this particular disease. I'm having a little mouse difficulty here. I'm going to see if I can go with a keyboard to try and change slides and see if that works. Here's a case of some sort of general blotchiness modeling yellowing on some, again, longleaf needles. But this is not a needle cast disease. You can see that the spots are less distinct, more diffuse edges, just more of a general yellowing. And so this would not be a direct foliar disease on this particular sample. Shift gears a little bit and talk about rhizosphere needle cast on spruce. This is another case where it could possibly be confused with another problem. Does anybody have an idea of what else might cause shedding of needles on the lower interior portion of a spruce or other conifer? Lack of light, yes, just shading out. Natural senescence, the needle or a leaf is not getting enough light to be productive for the tree, it may just shed it. Uh, someone said mites. I would have to check with our entomologist on that uh, as to whether mites will actually cause needles to drop off. I'm going to have to owe you that one. But in this particular case, it was a disease called rhizosphere needle cast or needle blight caused by the fungus rhizosphere calcophii. It occurs on spruces, mainly blue spruce and Norway spruce. That's pretty much what we see it on in North Carolina. And in North Carolina, this disease is restricted to you folks who are living in the mountains. It's going to mostly occur, but not entirely, uh, or not restricted to the lower portion of the tree. And the infections can occur on the young or even older needles. So it's a little bit different from, let's say, Ploioderma. But they do have to be wet. You have to have something like 48 hours of wetness before this can infect the needles. Um, the symptoms can show up at different times of the year, but most of our samples are coming in uh, diagnosed with this disease early fall to early winter. Air movement in this case may be a helpful practice, making sure that things are pruned around your trees so that the needles do dry off relatively soon after rainfall. Here's a close-up of spruce with Right this year, needle cast, you can see that up close, the spots or bands are not quite as striking as they are with the brown spot needle blight, but it does have some spotting and eventual death and defoliation. If you look up close under the microscope, you'll see that the fruiting bodies of the rhizosphera of the fungus are pushing up through the stomates, and they leave this little cap of wax that normally plugs the stomate on the top of them. It's quite characteristic of this disease. I should mention that there's another needle cast disease on spruces caused by the fungus Stigmina lautii that can be similar to this. All right, moving along to the other thing that we see so much this time of year, which is bare bark and bare branches. And a little quote from Shakespeare there. There are several things that people may notice and be concerned about on bark and on branches, some of which we've already talked about. We covered sooty molds in the Plants, Pests, and Pathogens session back in August of 2011. And we talked about wood decay fungi, which can spoil later fruit on these trees and limbs back in October of 2011. And I'll hit on just two other examples today of fungi that you may see this time of year on bark. And I'll also talk a little bit about mosses and lichens. This photograph was sent in by, I think this was Bob Filburn who sent it in, but I gave the photo credit to the person whose name was on the sample since it was submitted by the grower. 
This is a great example of the fungus Septobacidium, not sure what species it is, on branches of a Japanese holly shrub. And here's a picture from Wayne County from a couple of years back, taken by Karen Blada, who is a former extension agent. And you can see these felty patches, different colors depending on the species, on smooth bark trees or shrubs. I saw some, oh, this is over a month ago now, I think, out on a new greenway trail in kind of a wetland area in, here in Garner. It turns out that this particular fungus is not directly damaging to the plant. But that doesn't mean there's not a problem, because this is the Septobacidium in general is something that's going to be intimately associated with colonies of scale insects. And I've read it both ways, that it's parasitic or that it's symbiotic with the scales. And I wish I had a little bit more information to share on that particular interesting aspect of its biology. But the point is that if you've got Septobacidium, you should be looking to see if you have a scale problem. So the decline or the lack of vigor in the dieback of the Japanese maple in the previous photograph could be associated with the scales or there could be some other disease or site or abiotic problem that was causing it. But it wasn't the septobacidium in and of itself. This one I include for completeness, but you probably won't get too many people concerned about it. It is uh, inconspicuous and almost attractive. This fungus is Dendrothelia nivosa that occurs on cedar trunks. And it's a white fungus, a basidiomycete. The name nivosa comes from the Latin word meaning full of snow. And you can kind of see that the snow white color of it is quite apt, or the name is quite apt for the color. Here are some very unhappy azaleas in a hedge on the north side of D.H. Hill Library here on NC State campus. And the foliage is quite reddish. There's dieback and defoliation on the branches. And in some cases, you will get this happen. A homeowner will have a sample that will contain the lichens that are growing on the dead or dying branches. and might mistakenly believe that they're causing the problem on the shrub. But they're just taking advantage of a location, a place to hang out, maybe a little bit more light because the leaves have dropped off. And you can even get, as was the case on this shrub, actual moss growing on the branches. But again, when you see this, the question is, what's happening lower down? Was there a canker lower on the branch? Is there a root rot going on? Is there a problem in the soil? Just to talk a little bit about lichens themselves, they are a symbiosis, a working together of two very different kinds of organisms. One is a fungus, and one is an alga. And there are different fungi that are involved, and there are different algae. The fungus is usually an ascomycete, but can sometimes be a basidiomycete. These are two, uh, the two largest groups of the true fungi. And the alga is usually a green alga, but sometimes a cyanobacterium, or what we sometimes call a blue-green alga. These come in different kinds of forms. Some are crusty, as you can see a few on the right here. Crust on the surface, they can occur on trees or even on stones. Ignore for the moment the red tufts here, because that's actually a, another kind of fungus that's punching through the lichens from the branch underneath. But these other white, gray, uh, and greenish, even these orange structures here are associated with the lichens. Some are what we call folios lichens, so they look a little bit flakier. And then there are even what are called fruticos lichens, which have a sort of a leafy look to them, or can be uh, stalked or frond-like. And an example of one of those is our old man's beard lichen, or usnea species. This is from a sample from Guilford County in May of last year, and we can see the lichen growing on the surface of this dead branch. It's not what killed the branch, however. And in the same sample was included something that I won't really take time to go into, but a very interesting type of organism called a jelly lichen. I believe this was a species of Colima, but I can't be 100% sure. We won't be seeing those at this time of year, but you may see them in wet soils as our temperatures start to warm up.
Lichen reproduction is particularly interesting because since there's symbiosis of, of two different kinds of organisms, how do they do it? Well, sometimes the fungus will undergo sexual reproduction by itself. You can see these black structures in this case on the lichen on the left, and those will produce spores that will blow off in the wind, and then they'll have to find a, an alga to mate up with, or pair up with, is probably better said, at its new location. Sometimes, though, there can be an asexual reproduction in lichens, such as these almost dust-like particles here forming on the surface of a lichen that contain both a fungal and algal partner. And those can, when they reach a new location, start growth. And here is under the microscope, you can see that both the fungus, the thread-like filaments here, and the alga, the green rounded cells, are present in those, they're called ceridia, those little uh, dust-like pills on the photograph before. Oh, I just spoiled my pop quiz. OK. Well, uh, the last thing on lichens and, and mosses, you can see both of them in this case, which way is north? Well, yes, they do grow more heavily on the north side of the tree, although they can occur on all sides. But you'll find that the growth is, growth is heaviest on the north side of the tree. So I want to talk a little bit about problems that will be coming up in the next couple of months. But I wanted to do that by way of a pop quiz for you folks. So everybody take out a clean piece of paper and number it from 1 to 8. I would ask that please, please do not enter your answers or guesses on the chat or the whiteboard so that everyone will have a chance to think about and uh, try and come up with their best answer. So March and April landscape problems. These are all going to be landscape, um, most of them ornamentals. And let's see how good you are. Number one. The host is Hollyhock. Number two. The host is Red Cedar. Number three, the host is Japanese maple. Number four, the host is Camellia. Number five, the host again is Camellia. Number six, the host clearly is flowering dogwood. Number seven is Lalali Pine. And number eight is Calorie Pear. All right, I wanted to call on people, have you raise your hand and put people on the spot and all that. But I see that we don't have much time. So I'll just have you pass your paper to your neighbor, and everyone can grade each other. Number one was Hollyhock Rust. Number two 
blood is cedar apple rust. So they're both rust diseases, but with very different kinds of symptoms and signs. So when we get our first warm spring rains, we'll start seeing this on the galls. Number three was philistica leaf spot. These very light colored leaf spots on Japanese maple. Oribacidium is another, and anthracnose disease is another one that can cause very light colored spotting on the darker leaved Japanese maples. Exobacidium leaf gall was number four. It can also occur on rhododendron and azalea. Seberina petal blight or camellia petal blight on camellia was the fifth one and we talked about this in an earlier session. I think it was uh, last February of plant specimen pathogens. This is the one where the sclerotia sit in the soil all summer long and then the spore production is timed with the emergence of the flowers in the spring. So keep those raked up or mulched over. Spot anthracnose of dogwood was number six. Not to be confused with dogwood anthracnose, which is a more serious disease and only occurs in the mountains. But this spotting on these bracts is spot anthracnose. Number seven was yet another rust disease. This is fusiform rust on loblolly pine. So we will uh, see the orange spore production coming out on these large swellings on the trunks. Of course, a risk for breakage at that point. And number eight, fire blight. Very classic symptom with the crook neck or the uh, shepherd's crook at the tip of the blighted branch. So. Add up your scores and give me a green check here if you got them all right. Let's see. There's a list up there. I think we got one person who got them all right, too. All right, congratulations. And just to wrap up really quickly, then. A few other things that we can be on the watch for in the coming couple of months. Different botrytis diseases still, uh, caker on rose, botrytis on strawberry, pansy, geranium, and several other types of plants. It's a uh, non-discriminatory sort of pathogen. In the cool weather, we'll still have a chance of sclerotinia stem rot on some of our crucifers. And we could get uh, downy mildew, so be sure and be on the watch out for that. We may start seeing in May, um, I'm not sure if it would come in before that, late blight of potatoes. Still too early for late blight on tomatoes, but you may start seeing it on potato. Fight off the root rot showing its effects on many different woody plants. With Photina and Indian hawthorn, the perennial problem of Entomosporium leaf spot. Powdery mildew on just about everything. In turf, yeah, by by May, we could start seeing brown patch on our fescue, and we'll, of course, be seeing spring dead spot on our Bermuda grass. And as a general problem, be aware of fertilizer injury, people getting a little bit uh, too gung-ho when they get out in the spring and want to do their fertilization programs. So with that, I will take a quick question, because I see I'm a little bit over time. Mike, thank you so much. I really appreciate all, all the wonderful information. So well organized. All right, looks like uh, somebody has his hand up here. Mike Wilder. All right. I'm not sure if you're if you're able to type it in. Please do that into the chat box because I'm not hearing an audio. Oh, sorry, wrong button. Okay. All right, if there are okay. no questions, then I'll turn it back over to Lucy. Thank you all. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate wonderful presentation. A couple of quick announcements before you guys head out. I want to make sure that all of you realize that we have a new list serve for Extension Master Gardeners in North Carolina. It's ncemgv at list.ncsu.edu. Why can't you hear me? I have my. Can you hear me now? Hello, hello, hello? Nope. 
you can so some people can hear. Okay. All right. Sorry. So we have a, a new email list for Extension Master Gardeners in North Carolina. It's ncemgv at list.ncsu.edu. And we'd love to have you join us there. We'll be sending announcements out that way. Um, <coughs> also I want to invite you to the statewide page for the um, ncsugarden.com. You all have county pages that you've been working on extensively. We also have lots of information on this statewide page. You get there by pushing you, the statewide button that's up at, at the top right corner of your screen, and that will take you to this green background. And it works the exact same way as your, your county page, but it's got information that's, a, that's appropriate to Extension Master Gardeners across the state. Our new public website for Extension Master Gardener program is now up. It's at ncemgv.org. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff here. We have uh, uh, rotating success stories. We have all the current information on hours and volunteers and in-kind donations from Extension Master Gardeners. We have county-specific information that you can get. These, each one of these um, buttons up here opens up into a, a a deep menu of specific information about the Master Gardener program. There's a volunteer in the spotlight a profile of individual Extension Master, master Gardeners. Our master, North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Facebook page is, is in this um, feed here. We also have headlines. So anytime Extension Master Gardeners in North Carolina are mentioned in the news, um, those fill into this feed. And then we have a blog to the National Extension Master Gardener um, blog, so we have a feed to that, and that's all on the front page of the website. Lots more um, below. Come and explore, and help. Um. Another new thing that we've, we've got is a statewide calendar that is for consumer horticulture events. It includes um, the opportunity for you to post events from all the different counties. So you can come and, and see the either a, a calendar view or you can push and see a list view that gives you a little bit more details. You can click on individual event to get more details and it's searchable. So you can type into this search box Forsyth County or Forsyth and up will come all of the events that are just in Forsyth. Or you can type in Winston-Salem and just get the things that are in Winston-Salem. We have a pre-programmed button for Extension Master Gardener events. So if you click on this, it does an automatic search for you for, for just the Extension Master Gardener events. Um, we're, it's based on Google, so all of those events that you are now, agents that you are creating now and putting on your own Google uh, calendar, all you need to do is to invite the state calendar. And I've sent you an email with directions on how you can Im invite, you paste the, the address for this calendar in as, as a guest, and it will automatically show up here. We're um, coming up to the end of our campaign to get Extension Master Gardener logo um, license plates made. We have to have 300 of them to get them printed. And uh, we're up to about 177. We're going to end the campaign in June. So you have between now and June to get your order in to, to help us get uh, license plates for the Extension Master Gardener program. It's a really exciting opportunity for us because $10 of every $20 that goes into purchasing these, these specialty plates goes directly to our endowment. So it's a wonderful fundraising thing. You only have to make a one-year commitment. It's not like you have to agree to have this plate on your car for the rest of your life. You can just do it for one year. And, um, and that helps us get up to our 300 minimum, and then we can um, just to add, get more as we need it. But we do have to get that 300 minimum by June or, or we'll just we won't be able to do this. Some of the things that are upcoming, the next Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association board meeting will be in Union County on April 17th. That will have a heavy focus on our upcoming conference. Um, the next Plants, Pests, and Pathogens will be in April, April 23rd at, at 10. And the conference will be in Union County on May, oh, is that right? May 30th to June 1st. I'm I want to double check those dates. Anyway, the, it's coming up in in Union County in the first part of June, and then the international conference is, it will be in September. So hope that you'll be able to join us for all of those. So it's May 30th to June 1st, the Central Master Gardener Conference in Union County, June 6th through the 8th. Okay, so I got the dates wrong. My profuse apologies. I was thinking that that didn't sound right. Okay, so Gina says it's June 6th through the 8th, so it's the, ne it's the next weekend. I think this was when it was originally planned, and we moved it a long time ago. 
Okay. Any questions that anybody has? It, is that um, one in the address? Yeah, the agents will be gathering on the fifth for an in-service training for cooperative extension agents, and then the conference itself is the sixth through the eighth. So I'm going to move us off off that. And I'm not sure which address the the Durham question was about. So ask me again about about the uh, website address, license plate address. Uh, it's a tinyurl.com at 9LPOMME. All right, thank you guys for joining us. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.